All right. Hi, virtual good evening to all of you that are joining us. I'm Karen Daniels and I'm with Thurston County Equine Outreach. On behalf of our president, Jennifer Line, I'd like to welcome you to our very first visual training on equine emergency response planning. We're a volunteer group with Thurston County Emergency Management Department. And in 2017, we transitioned from Thurston County Sheriff's Office, changed our name from Mounted Patrol and joined emergency management due to the changing needs of our community. I wanna uh, shout out a big thank you to Vivian Eason, our emergency management liaison and Ms. Zoom Guru, who has helped us set this whole virtual training up. This training session is dedicated to our 2020 president, Karen Ingle, who passed away unexpectedly in late December. Karen's vision for TCEO was to produce a video that guided horse owners to develop their own personal emergency response plan for any disaster that might come up. Well, this is our very first step towards that goal. Unfortunately, uh, our honored guest speaker tonight, our keynote speaker, Stacy Kendall, who is the founder of Southern California Equine Emergency Evacuation Initiative, is unable to participate. Uh, she called me uh, about 5.30 this evening. She was on her way to an incident command. They had a huge fire as a result of a car accident, wildfire, and she was responding to that because it was near a horse facility. So she's unable to join us and I will pitch in and try to share with you as much information as she has related to me over probably the last three to four years that we have been in a phone conversation over their initiative down there. Sue Beal is going to share her experiences with the September 2020 Bordeaux Ranch Mima Prairie Fire and provide valuable lessons learned from the perspective of the been there, done that. Uh, she's involved in that whole uh, uh, incident and can share with you uh, how that came out and what she did following uh, that incident. And I'm gonna take you through our emergency response action items, our protocol forms, information, all of which are accessible on the website and on our Facebook. And we'll give you all that information at the end of this presentation. We're gonna ask you to hold questions and probably post questions either through our email or on a chat box, uh, but we're gonna run through this in an hour and there will be an opportunity to give us your feedback and thoughts and we'll probably schedule a second or third uh, initiative because we're not gonna be able to cover everything uh, tonight. So you see the slide, the purpose of the presentation. It's basically fairly simple. We want to increase your awareness of natural disasters that could potentially affect your horse. This is all about horses and mules, your barn, your training or boarding facility. If you don't have a response plan, if you have not thought about what if something happens and I'm at work, I'm at school, I'm out of state, I'm on a camping trip and I get a call that there's a fire or a flood and my horses need horse or horses need to be evacuated. We want you to learn what SKI, the Southern California Equine Evacuation uh, Program has accomplished uh, since their initiative probably five, six years ago in, in response to California fires and floods and why we have used uh, their material to develop our protocols. So we, we're using everything California has done. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. And um, we think they have just an absolutely wonderful um, model to follow. 
You'll hear firsthand from Sue Beal what it's like to be on a quiet trail ride with one of her best friends in Capitol Forest and get a phone call that a wildfire is sweeping through her neighborhood on the border of Capitol Forest. We're gonna review our Thurston County Equine Outreach how-to process, documents, show you our forms, our lists, our protocol, and where to obtain them and how to use them effectively. And we're gonna walk you through how to develop your own personal emergency response plan that will work for your particular situation. And finally, we need you. Any interested community members, we need you to join our volunteer group and help us spread the word to make our community safer. Um, there are quotes on that previous slide that I just wanna bring your attention to. You all have heard of the fires in Australia that <clears throat> resulted with a half a billion wildlife and animals killed in Australia. And they say time and time again, <clears throat> if you don't take precautions as soon as possible, when you have that enthusiasm, when you have that initiative, the chances are that you won't do anything at all to prepare for an emergency. So I strongly urge you to get going on this before the, the dry season, uh, get going on things to put together for a response plan. Start with that enthusiasm and don't end with complacency. Don't think about incidences being just in California or uh, in the South with floods. <clears throat> Thurston County's had wildfires in, at Scatter Creek, uh, came very close to the Scatter Creek uh, stable riding center and arena in 2018 in Grand Mound. They had a fire that jumped the freeway. And in 2020, last September, we had the Bordeaux Ranch Mima, Mima Prairie fire. We've had floods in Lewis and Thurston County in 96 and 2007 and 2009, where we had to help uh, through mounted patrol, uh, rescue animals <clears throat> and evacuate animals from floods. Of course, our big earthquake in 2001, we learned that cell phones, cell towers were out, landlines didn't work and there were no phones uh, that worked, very few phones that worked unless you had uh, some type of uh, uh, emergency phone. We've had landslides, mudslides and snowstorms in our state and natural and man-made disasters. So all of the things we're gonna talk about tonight are uh, totally uh, pursuant to what needs we have in our state. I'm gonna jump into uh, some information, try to do the best I can with sharing some information from the SKI program. This started as a volunteer program in California, Southern California about five, six years ago with 10 members. At that point, they were experiencing fires during what they called fire season. It was maybe once a month, twice a month that a fire would pop up. All of a sudden, they had seven fires in a week in December of 2017, and it resulted in over 100 horses killed in that one week. <clears throat> The fires were the San Diego and San Diego County Lilac Fire. And some of you have probably remember hearing about these on the news. It was at the San Luis Rey Training Center, which is a supportive center to uh, Del Mar. They had over 500 stalls, 474 horses were there and they lost 46 horses that died in that fire at 11 o'clock some of the staff smelled smoke. The fire was several miles away. There was one vet on duty that day and he called for immediate uh, evacuation of the horses. They started evacuating horses and bringing, um, bringing trailers in. The fire became, came up to 300 yards away in a canyon and the wind grew from 20 to 60 miles an hour and the wildfires in that vicinity resulted in closed roads 
and only first responders were allowed in and they were only evacuating people. The evacuation vans and horse trailers couldn't get through the blocked roads. Um, by five o'clock, the trailers finally arrived to evacuate horses to Del Mar, but they had lost number of horses. December 5th to January 9th, they had the Creek Fire in LA County. There was an Arabian ranch that had young foals there that weren't halter broke. They couldn't get the foals in because they couldn't catch them. They couldn't lead them. They couldn't get them in the trailer and the mares wouldn't leave the foals. And it was a total cluster. They lost in, in that LA <clears throat> County Creek Fire, they lost 29 out of 60 horses. There were 115 people evacuated, three firefighters were injured, and the fire didn't stop entirely until January 9th when it started raining. The final fire I'm gonna talk about was, excuse me, the Rancho Padilla fire. And that was on December 9th in 2017. They had 60 stalls. It was a private boarding stable owned by the Padilla family for 29 years. Um, there were 29 out of 60 horses that died, died in that fire. Some of the stall do doors were locked because the owner of a stallion there had put a lock on a stall to prevent people from breeding his stud for free. And so a number of the other renters followed that, followed suit in that and they couldn't get the keys in time. They couldn't open the locks and uh, 29 horses perished in that fire. The fire department directed evacuation of family and friends only and would not allow evacuation of horses. The final fire was the Thomas fire. Many of you have heard of that and that was in Santa Barbara County. And that was in December as well. It was the largest fire in California history with over 273,000 acres burnt. It was a result of this horrific week that people were mobilized in Southern California to do something specifically about these horse farms boarding facilities to make sure that when they had transport groups and trailers ready to evacuate that they would be allowed through the line. You'll hear from Sue about the Mima, Mima Prairie fire we had trailers and people lined up. They saw on Facebook, there was a fire at Bordeaux Ranch. People jumped in their trailers or hooked up their trailers and trucks. They were lined up on Waddell, ready to evacuate and the fire and law enforcement would not let them in that subdivision. The same exact thing happened in California. So uh, Stacy Kendall and this ski group started working with agencies. They um, developed a partnership with animal control, with state and federal forest agencies, law enforcement from county and state agencies, and fire departments from county and state agencies in 10 counties, from San Luis Obispo to the Mexican border. Stacy has recently told me that, and I think she put this on Facebook, that the narrative has changed for Southern California. It used to be they talked about fire season and now they say it's always fire season. It used to be once a month or so and now it's almost daily that they are responding to fires. So their general guidelines are that the call centers, the 911 dispatch and call centers, if their horse is involved, they call, they put uh, notes on Facebook and ski uh, transport officers will uh, gather their transport teams. They have developed evacuation teams, transport teams with three members. They have one person to drive that has to be a horse handler certified. One person to handle horses that has to have be, again be certified to handle horses and one to document and photograph all activities. California Highway Patrol has lists of all the haulers and these teams, the license numbers. These, they certify their trucks and trailers and they have names of the volunteers that drive and are part of these three person teams. They're tailor-made to each county and they follow the procedures 
specific to that county, although the training is standardized for all the volunteers with SKI. All the volunteers are backgrounded and specific volunteers are certified transporters. Okay, they can be, again, be drivers or documenters, photographers. All the hauling vehicles and trailers also, again, are certified by the highway patrol. So they are allowed into those fire areas where other vehicles are not. Even some of the owners are not allowed in there, owners of homes. <clears throat> They hold clinics for organizations, agencies, horse clubs on how to be prepared. And they have, um, I think, four different areas on their Facebook that people can volunteer from recruiting and training volunteers to uh, gathering resources, halters and hay and grain for horses that have been evacuated and need to be fed uh, to transport groups. But I would encourage all of you to look at their um, Facebook page. And you have to type out Southern California Equine Emergency Evacuation. So it's kind of long, but uh, it's just a wealth of information. When they <clears throat> go on these transport teams, they take pictures of each horse. They take photographs of where they came from, the address, the barn name, and photographs of the truck and trailer that transport them, the license numbers. Um, so that there's a document of uh, every horse that's picked up. I learned from Stacy that fires grow two times a minute by, a, by square root. So a two foot fire grows to a 32 square foot fire in five minutes, something I never knew. And that's without high winds. So you can imagine these wildfires, especially if you were involved in in any of the fires that we've had here. Um, they also recommend that you leave the rescue to professionals. You're prepared to prepared for unleadable horses uh, that a lot of horses are not trained to lead. They might just be out in a pasture all the time. And uh, if you are involved in transporting that, that you're prepared and trained for that. And also that most emergency response staff, including emergency management, volunteers, law enforcement, fire department, have no horse experience. So to have a group that is specific to horse needs and specific to training of how to do response plans and in the future to transport is something that um, our goal is to adopt from that uh, ski program. So, um, where are we? So I think I'll turn this over to Sue, be able to talk about lessons learned and the Bordeaux Mama Prairie wildfire. Go, Sue. Thank well, you. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> I have quite a passion for this topic because of what happened to me on September 8th. And you can see this is a picture of uh, Mima Prairie. And that is my neighborhood right there, where all the smoke is. And Karen and I were up in the hills. We were riding Capitol Forest. We were parked down at Mima Trailhead and rode that big, I think it's like a 15 mile loop around. And we were up at the Fall Creek area we found that there was logging going on, so we couldn't go any further and we had to end up coming all the way back. So it turned out to be quite a long ride that day. Well, when we were, we were taking a break and we were up at the top um, and Karen's phone went off and my phone went off pretty much at the same time. My call was from my husband. And he's, he said, where are you? And I said, I'm up in Capitol Forest. And he said, the property's on fire. And Karen got a call also um, telling her the same thing. So all I could think was, can anyone get in? And he said, nope, no, they're not letting anyone in because the fire is going right across the road that we enter into our neighborhood. And my, I had a horse left back on the property. I have two horses. I, I had one of them with me. The other one was on the property. 
And um, so I thought I, I've got to get her out of there. And um, I called my neighbor and my neighbor was pretty upset. She was very fearful. And she said, I don't have a truck. My husband took the truck and she fortunately had a three horse trailer. So she was trying to brainstorm what to do to get her two horses out and to get mine out. So she ended up talking to a neighbor who had a truck who came over and it was um, quite a fiasco because she was trying to figure out which ball to use to hook up her trailer to put in her the neighbor's truck and time was of the essence. As Karen was saying, this, these fires spread very quickly. And there was a wind, as you can see here, there was a wind happening and it was going southwest and a transformer blew, a spark fell, and my neighbor told me he saw it happen. And within five minutes, it had gone, it had traveled at least 20 acres to my property. So it was that quick. So make sure that you have, uh, I, I would suggest that your truck is hooked to your trailer when you know that there is a flood season or a fire season. Now our property was very dry. I didn't expect that there was gonna be a fire, but it happens, it is really dry and we just need to have our trailer hooked up. We also um, have to ensure that our horses can load into the trailer. So I had a neighbor who hadn't loaded her horse into the trailer for over a year. And you can imagine with her anxiety and the horse seeing the fire, it, that, was, that was a difficult situation. Have your halters and your lead ropes available. If you um, have them hooked onto your stall, um, that would be very fortunate because my neighbor was running over to my house and she had to have a halter for my horse. So fortunately, I have mine hung right, uh, right at the stall, right next to the horse. And we're going to talk to you about our collars and clip-ons clip and the forms that you can fill out. Um, we do have an information form that you can put all of your horse information on. And then you can put it into the collar or you can hang it on the stall door or you can put it on a clip on. And my neighbor could have just grabbed that, put it on my horse and then left. Um, we only have one way in and one way out in our neighborhood. And I've been told that that's actually um, a benefit to subdivisions that it's very appealing to people who live in the subdivision to only have one way in and one way out, because then you don't have all that through traffic coming in. Well, that exit was closed. So um, I had three or four neighbors who were trying to find out, a, trying to find a way out that wasn't coming out that in that direction into the fire. So the fire is burning towards them and they're trying to get out. So they tried to go west, which as you can see is Capitol Forest. And they got to a DNR gate, one of those heavy metal gates. And of course it was locked so they couldn't get through there. So one of the neighbors had a chainsaw and he was trying to cut, cut the gate. And that wasn't happening fast enough if it, happened at all. So they turned, they were able to turn their horse trailers around and the, these are three horse trailers. One, uh, the smoke was so thick that they could not see where they were going. So they kind of got disoriented and were hoping that they were going in the right direction, but they literally could not see an inch before their face. So one of my neighbors thought if I run into a ditch or some obstacle and I get hung up on it, then we're, we're gonna die. My horses and I are gonna die. So she opened up her door to the cab of her truck and the flames shot in to the truck. So she thought that's not a good idea and she shut the door. And she said, fortunately, 
the wind shifted a little bit and she could see in front of her. So she drove through a pasture and then out um, one of the, the roads, it's a lane that's next to us. And um, she, she was able to get out that way and then go down Mima Gate Road to Rochester. And um, the other two uh, were able to get out that way also, but they all thought they may have died. They were that, um, it was that intense. So make sure that you have an evacuation route. And, and when I've talked to many of my friends, many of them have said, we don't have a second exit. And I need to think about that. And whether you're running with your horse with you or you're driving with a truck and trailer, which is safer, by the way, um, you need to have another egress to get out. So make sure you plan that. You know, sometimes also you're gonna to have to decide which horses are gonna go and which ones are gonna stay. Um, fortunately, my neighbor had a three horse trailer. She has two horses and she was able to put my horse in her trailer. Had she not done that, she could have put her in an area where um, it's a large area where there's no vegetation and you know, pretty overgrazed and don't leave halters or blankets on your horses when there's a fire because they'll just melt right into the horse. It's very dangerous for them. Um, also determine where you're going to evacuate your horses. Um, my neighbor took my horse to uh, a stable that I didn't even know existed. Um, so, and that was fine with me, um, but I had no idea where my horse was. Um, that's why the clip on or the collar is so important uh, because then the, the manager, the barn stable manager or the owner would get that horse because she was getting more than one coming in. She would get that horse you know, and all that information would be there for for her. Who owns this horse? Can you pasture the horse with another one? What do they eat? What medications, et cetera? And we'll go over that form in a little more detail. And then talk to your neighbor. Make sure that you have a plan. If I didn't, uh, you know, I've ridden with my neighbor. We're very good friends. If she thought about my horse. If we weren't friends, she wouldn't even thought about, oh my gosh, she, you know, the other horse is still there. So make sure you do talk to them and maybe you can plan an emergency evacuation route together. And then have emergency numbers with you at all times. When I was up in the forest, Karen and I were talking and I said, you know, my neighbor doesn't have a truck. What are we going to do? And Karen was immediately on the phone to talk to people who had trucks and trailers to help out. And boy, they did, they, they rallied and they came and they were lined up. <laughs> I think they were at the Maytown Saloon or the um, Little Rock Saloon and they were parked along the road. And it was, when, when Karen and I came out, we came down Bordeaux Road, which you can see, that's right where the fire is edged right there. Um, it was pretty daunting to see those trees on fire and um, drive past that. And then when we came down Mima Gate, all the trucks and trailers were all lined up and it was just like, wow, people are so generous to give their time and energy to, to save horses. So having those emergency numbers with me were very important. So Another thing that I learned is that my property needed some work and I needed to make some improvements because of the high fire risk that we have out here in the prairie. So um, one of my neighbors was over and he was hosing down the area around our house because he knew if he saved my house, his house would be saved. So while he was hosing it down, the power went out and then of course I had no water. So we couldn't continue to water it. Um, another neighbor had just turned their sprinkler system on 
And that really helped. Um, you could see that it did not burn wherever the, the water sprinkler system was. So we installed a sprinkler system and a generator. And then we put a two to three foot rock bear, uh, border around the house. So because the fire actually burnt part of my house, it just burnt the grass all the way up to the edge and then started the house on fire. So having that border, I think is gonna be helpful. And then we put pavers down around our propane tank because that would have been a nasty thing that would have happened if it would have started on fire. So the other thing is re be sure to review your insurance policy. Um, we had not looked at our insurance policy in a number of years. And what we found is that we had insured the barn for about 50,000. And you know what? We could not build a barn for 50,000. <laughs> not anymore, especially this time. And also our fencing, the insurance paid 25% of the cost of the fencing and the loafing sheds, all of that was burnt. We had to, um, we had to rebuild all of that. So it was a huge expense to us. So these are the lessons that I have learned. And Karen's gonna give you some more information. And you're muted, Karen. How's that? Okay, thank you, Sue. One other comment I wanna make about this uh, uh, Bordeaux fire is my niece worked at a uh, boarding training facility that's located in, uh, in the Bordeaux uh, subdivision and um, found on the generator issue, our first uh, action item here, that when she saw the sparks come off the, um, the electrical iron start that wildfire at Bordeaux and head towards the barn that had uh, just under 40 horses, I think they had 38 or 39 horses installs in the barn. She immediately got hoses out, hooked them up and started watering right next to the barn and uh, kept that up until the electricity went out. There was no hoses, there was no water and she couldn't, um, she couldn't stop the fire that was approaching. Fortunately, the owner was able to get in and get the generator going that started the hoses and they were able to wet the barn down, but a corner of the barn did burn. Um, when I listened to her story within the week after this fire, um, I wanted to cry because they were so close to losing that entire barn of horses had they not had a generator, had the owner not been allowed to come in uh, because she was there all by, she was by herself doing this uh, with this barn full of horses. So um, these things happen and they happen so quickly and so unexpectedly that we just want everyone to be prepared. So the first thing is that generator. It will run your water hoses. It'll run your electricity. If it goes out, your electrical outlets and your lights. If something happens at night and you need light, if you got a generator, you can turn the lights on. A uh, fire extinguisher is very important to have around your barn or even uh, you know in your grass or whatever, it can put a spark out. You have to have it operational, um, available, and you have to be trained on how to use a fire extinguisher. Some people have never even looked at a fire extinguisher. So it's really important to just become familiar with one if you wanna get one for your barn. I'd encourage you to keep your water troughs full. A lot of people let their water kind of go down, rinse them out. I have in the past. At this point, I keep them full and I keep a bucket near that water trough because you never know if something comes up, maybe just dousing a spark or something would prevent a fire from, from catching on in your pasture. Extra water hoses are another recommendation to reach around your barn or your buildings and have nozzles handy. Have those nozzles handy because you need those nozzles on the end of your hoses. If you have to leave your horses in the barn, evacuate your horses or take them to a neighbor or turn them loose in a pasture. Leave a sign on the outside of your barn 
or your gate so that first responders know what to expect and they don't waste valuable time on an empty barn. Let them know there's no horses here. All the horses are in the pasture. There's five horses left in the barn, but leave signs <clears throat> so people know exactly what the situation is. Mark your exits clearly from the inside. So if you have a, a large barn with a couple exits on either end or three or four doors, make big, big uh, signs for those that those are exits. People get disoriented in fire, become smoky, dusty, et cetera, horses jumping around and you can't see. So make sure that you have those exits uh, clearly marked. Um, another thing that fire departments and emergency management stress is to drive down your street and see how clearly you can see your street address. If there's a branch or a tree in front of it that you can't clearly see your street address, cut the branch, trim the tree back, replace the sign, but make sure people can see uh, see that street address so if the fire department does get there they can uh, clearly see what to um, where you are smoke detectors don't work in a barn and um, because it's too dusty that's that's been the experience of folks that are involved in these uh, fires so i just pass that one along Sprinkler systems are recommended by the California Humane Society for all barns after the San Luis Rey Training Center fire in 2017. So if you have a large barn, you might want to think about installing a sprinkler system. Or one, one clear thing that came out of the San Luis Rey videos, if you ever have a chance to get on the internet and view these, is to not leave your stall doors open if you move your horse out of a stall. When these horses are in the middle of an evacuation and people are running around and adrenaline's running, if they get loose, they go right back to their stall. So you will see in that San Luis Rey uh, video, horses that got away, people that turned horses out of their stall just to move them out. There weren't enough halters or people to lead them. So they just turned them loose thinking they would run out they did run out, they did run around the barn. There's a whole herd of them that ran around the barn and they went right back in that burning barn to their stall. Their stall doors were left open, they went in the stall and burned. So if, if nothing else you get out of this, do not leave your stall door open when you pull a horse out to evacuate it in an emergency. Conduct practice drills. This is what Sue talked about. Talk to your neighbors, do tabletop exercises with your neighbors and friends. And if nothing else, organize a Zoom meeting and walk through scenarios of who, what, where, when, and how. What are you gonna do if this happens, if that happens, if you're camping, if you're at work, who, if your neighbor's at work and they call you, what are the resources you have, the equipment? What do you need to, uh, take care of your friends and neighbors and what do they need to take care of your your horses same way if no other options exist <clears throat> or if other options exist i should say don't use rogue volunteers that you don't know to haul your horses we've heard lots of war stories relating to volunteers that showed up posing as well-meaning helpers and either forgot about taking down names and numbers uh, of uh, where to go or what, what, uh, where they were going. The horse owners didn't bother to take license numbers down or names of people that were helping them evacuate their horses. And some of them never saw their horses again. In the Texas floods, <clears throat> we've heard about the Texas floods, people showed up posing as FEMA workers with horse trailers and ended up stealing the, the, their horses and they never saw their horses again. So lots of war stories, know who's taking your horse, get some credentials, look at driver's license, take a picture with your phone of their license uh, numbers and just don't let anybody take your horse away. Uh, goes without saying wood barns are the most susceptible to fires. 
So make sure any uh, grass or bushes are cut back, um, cleared out of the way of your, of your barn. Keep, uh, Sue talked about keeping extra halters in your trailer, your barn, your pasture, and try to use cotton or rope halters for any emergency evacuation because nylon burns easier and faster. Bolt cutters will get you through lock stall doors, gates and fences in an emergency evacuation. They needed that in that Rancho Padilla fire. Always keep a toolbox handy, either in your trailer or your truck or your barn or all three. Have those tools available that, that um, you may need, whether it's Chicago screws, bolt cutters, pliers, hammers, et cetera. Um, have just the essentials and we have lists of those that we'll share with you. Um, what's not on here is a no smoking sign on your property. So uh, for heaven's sakes, hang up a no smoking sign so people who come to visit, uh, just walking through, don't light up. It's super dangerous to have any type of smoking. There's too many combustible things. And speaking of combustible materials, try to store any combustible materials such as hay, grain, shaving, sawdust, where horse stalls are not located, somewhere else, another building. Highly recommended. It's a tough one as many of our barns are designed uh, to have all of that in, in one place. But if, if you can, try to store those combustible materials somewhere else. So we've given you some background and ideas of action items to consider. Keep in mind that these are only recollect, uh, recommendations. They're a compilation of best practices from across the country, specifically California. And not everything will work. Not everything is necessary for everyone. It depends on your own situation, where you live, how close you are to the fire department or to civilization, uh, what your immediate environment is like, who your neighbors are, how close they are, et cetera. So you have to develop what you think will work for you and use things uh, that we provide that um, will, help, will help you. So I'm gonna walk you through our eight step protocol. All the documents, instructions, uh, forms, lists, to-do lists are on our Thurston County uh, Equine Outreach website and our private Facebook page, um, TCO, under files. So you can go to our private uh, face, Facebook page, ask to join, let you join, go to the files and all of these forms and lists are there and they're fillable. So you can, you can fill them and copy them and run them off right from your computer. So the first of, the, of our first step is, it's really a good thing. It's an emergency response survey, pretty simple. There's about 20 questions and it's just an excellent tool to assess your preparedness. If you come up with a lot of no's, if you go through this, they're pretty straightforward questions. If you come up with a lot of no's, it's really time to act, to follow up. Um, these <clears throat> are things that, um, you know, pretty basic and uh, things to think about as well that you may not have thought about. The second step is our navigation instructions. And um, it's, uh, uh, pretty comprehensive in terms of what forms to use for what purpose. Uh, it's somewhat sequential, gives a lot of information on important components. And one of the couple of the things that I'd re reiterate is uh, that um, you need to establish a call tree with names and numbers, and kind of like a chain of authority of who's approved to make decisions on your horses. Uh, you know, kind of just a chain of authority and a call tree, call this person, that person will call this person, maybe for your neighborhood or your subdivision or whatever, um, to have some type of call tree in case you do have an emergency there. Have contact information from law enforcement and fire and uh, road closures from state patrol conditions 
whether it's a voluntary or mandatory evacuation, a lot of these evacuations have a status. If they give you a voluntary evacuation, we would strongly urge that you evacuate as soon as possible. The longer you wait, the higher the risk is, especially when you're trying to load horses and get a bunch of horses out of a community. It's a lot harder than just jumping in your car and driving out. Um, so uh, the to-do list, let's see. Yep, the to-do list. This is just a compilation of best practices and recommendations to ensure you're prepared for any emergency involving your horse or mule. And as you accomplish these tasks, you can check them off. It's pretty straightforward. It relates back to the survey and to a lot of the protocol that uh, other states have found to be very effective. We have a go bag list. While these lists seem a little overwhelming and woo, geez, I'll never get to all that. Once you take the time to assemble what your own personal go bag should look like, whether it's a personal bag of clothing and meds and things that would get you through a three day weekend or um, a horse uh, plastic bin that you can have in your trailer that would have emergency items in. It's done, they're available anytime in the future and you don't have to worry about it. It's there, it's ready to go. The next form is probably our most important form that you, you could use. And it's an, it's, uh, we call it our equine information form or evacuation form. It can just be used as an information form. Your horses can't talk. They can't tell somebody what they're allergic to or what uh, hay they can eat or can't eat or don't put me in with that gelding because they'll kick me. They can't talk to you. So this form gives all the information on your horse that anyone who's taking care of your horse for a day or a week on um, an emergency situation will know what to do if they can't get a hold of you. Again, sometimes cell phones and landlines are down and people can't communicate uh, in the manner that we're used to communicating. So this would be with your horse. These are two-sided, it's a two-sided form. You fill out both sides. Uh, the information is again on feeding and medication and treatment pasturing, farrier, who your vet is, etc. You take a picture of yourself with your horse, your horse and yourself together, copy it, print it, paste it onto that square, blank square on the first page. Uh, if you pull this up, it's a fillable form. You can, you can take a photo. If you have a photo of yourself with your horse and copy and paste it onto that form, so there's a picture of you and your horse. If there's any questions, it's, it's on there that you own that horse. Um, keep a hard copy handy of this. You can run it off, keep a hard copy handy. It can be saved, printed and distributed through email. And we recommend that you prepare a notebook. If you have a barn with several horses, get a regular loose leaf notebook put these information forms in their own sleeve. So each horse in the barn has an information sheet on them. And if, um, um, if you can get a hold of those numbers, put a list of emergency phone numbers and neighbors and keep that in a notebook that's readily available, either in your barn or an office in the barn, somewhere where everybody knows where that notebook is and uh, that can be picked up and taken with horses or um, used to contact other people. Also keep it, if you're a barn manager, keep a file uh, of everyone's horse with this evacuation information. We recommend that you keep it on a plastic sleeve on the stall door in a, in a bucket with a lid in your pasture or in an evacuation uh, collar. So this next slide is a photo of a collar that uh, we Thirsting, our group designed and are producing and they'll be available for a donation. Uh, it's waterproof with a plastic pocket for that information form. 
You can fold up the form after you put your picture on it and filled it out. You fold it up, you put it in the plastic waterproof pouch. One size fits all, it's Velcro. It fits on a pony and it fits on a draft horse. Uh, it has reflective tape. If the horse is out in the middle of the night and you're trying to find it and you've got a flashlight, uh, it does have reflective tape. Horses can break out of it if they're caught up on a fence or a tree, unlike webbing, it's just Velcro. It, um, you can wear it high on the neck as this uh, bay horse has, and, or you can move it down lower on their neck if you want to and use it <laughs> when you're riding. If you're jumping, you can hang on to it. Um, it's inexpensive. We made it inexpensive for 4-Hers and Pony Club kids. I've had a lot of endurance riders talk to me about it because if you're out riding endurance, sometimes you're all by yourself and uh, riding and you might get tossed out in the middle of nowhere and your horse runs off trying to find their friends and some rancher may ca catch the horse and not know there's an endurance ride going. So endurance riders are interested in, in uh, this collar. Uh, and have attained it. And also campers, if you're highlining your horse at a camp and, uh, you know, sometimes a, a bear, cougar, dog comes by and somehow your horse gets loose and takes off. If they've got a collar around, if somebody catches the collar, they've got your phone number and they can call you. So we're gonna be setting up a process to make these available to you on our Facebook site within the next several weeks. And again, it's a donation. We're asking for a $15 donation. These are other collars and clips that I found on the web, on, on the internet. And there may, be, there may be others available. These all look pretty good. Uh, the mainstay group has a clip. <clears throat> it's an ID clip that you simply clip in their main. Um, doesn't have a space to keep an information sheet, but you can write your phone number down or, or uh, address or whatever. Uh, Valley Vet has a in case of emergency clip on, and Equestra Safe has a collar. They have a web collar, and they, it comes in three sizes, uh, and all of those are available under under those um, websites. So I want to talk just a little bit about what our initiatives are right now and then in the future. <clears throat> We're in the process, of, uh, process right now of distributing letters, kind of an introduction letter to our group with our eight step process on developing um, an emergency response plan. And we're sending that out to stables and barns in Thurston County. We're starting with our county. Um, I know that uh, some of these links have gone outside Thurston County uh, on this uh, on this video training, virtual training, but we're really interested in doing a good job for our county first and then sharing. And of course, everything that we have is is on our website and Facebook so people can use that. Uh, it's public domain. Everyone can can use the information and forms free of charge that we have on our website. We're working in the future with emergency management to map all of the stables and barns in our county. And, and that really means that taking the sheriff's districts, which our county has five districts that the sheriff's office sets aside, the fire, has, the fire department has districts, and overlaying a, a map or mapping of barns and stables <clears throat> that have a high number of, um, of horses, training stables, boarding facilities, mapping out where those horses are as it relates to the districts, and then conducting a census of how many horses are located in that district. This, these are future goals. It isn't gonna happen right away, but we're following the model of California and this is what they're involved in because what they found when they've done the mapping, when there is an emergency or a fire, they know how many horses are in these various training facilities and barns, and then they can um, direct the right amount of resources 
to that area rather than trying to guess, well, how many horses? Do you have five horses or do you have 50 horses? Oh, look, they've got a boarding facility for 25 horses. So they can, can um, um, deploy the correct number of resources. So we're also doing training. We've talked to a number of the backcountry clubs and uh, we'll be working as COVID allows on in-person training to horse clubs, pony clubs, 4-H, um, Washington State uh, Horse Council, et cetera, on um, uh, in-person presentations. But um, we hope to have another virtual training in the future as well. And we'll see how this goes. This will be taped and available on our website and on our Facebook site so people can look back and, and see the information if they want to. We're recruiting staging sites or will be recruiting staging sites and evacuation sites so that again in those sheriff's districts will not only know what horses are with what barns and where they're located, but we will be able to match staging sites and evacuation sites. So staging sites are nothing more than big parking lots where rigs can pull in, whether it's Little Rock School or um, you know Home Depot uh, parking lot that people who are getting ready to evacuate can stage, get instructions, get the horses, come back there for where they're going to go to um, for evacuation sites and then recruit evacuation sites. People who might have additional stalls or pasture areas for one or two horses or five horses in an emergency up to three days uh, to be able to uh, house horses that may have been displaced as a result of a natural disaster, fire, flood, et cetera. And finally, we're trying to recruit and train volunteers. So I'm going to turn this over to Sue Beal, and she's going to talk about our initiative uh, of how um, uh, you can help if you're interested in becoming a volunteer with Thurston County Equine Outreach. Thank you. Thank you. So um, you've heard my passion about um, having an equine evacuation response plan. You know, I've had three fires here in, on my property and twice I've had to evacuate my horses and I still didn't have a plan. So my bad, and I'm not gonna do that again because each time it gets worse and worse and I almost lost a horse. I almost lost good friends actually. Um, so I really um, am happy to be a part of this group and, and um, feel energized to get the word out to, to have a response plan. Some people I've talked to say, well, I, I don't have a horse. What, you know, what, what can I do? And do I have to drive a trailer and pick horses up? And so administration, uh, we need a lot of help with Facebook and a website <laughs> editing because um, I struggle a bit with um, navigating that. So if, if somebody is a whiz bang person in those areas, that would be great. We need help with correspondence, um, with gathering resources, um, and of course, recruiting volunteers, more volunteers, conducting trainings like this and making presentations, writing articles for newsletters to get the word out, um, and just um, doing a host of things in an administrative um, position. Also, then if you do have equine um, experience, we are going to be training for a transport team as Southern California uh, has done. That's down the line um, further as we get more organized. Um, so, but more to come, we would love to have your energy and ideas. All right, so that's a wrap. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us. If you have questions or comments, please email us at Thurston County Equine Outreach, one word, dot com. We'll get your questions, our comments, 
and respond back to you. Remember to join our private Facebook page. Uh, and that's Thurston County Equine Outreach to access information, lists, forms, articles. We also have a website with emergency management and those forms are on the website. They're fillable on that county website. And then we have a Facebook page that's a community Facebook page, emergency management. We'll use that to publish directions. If there is emergency or alert, they will use that community Facebook page uh, to do that. Our private Facebook page, I'd encourage you to join that because we can set up communication on that private page uh, if you have questions and answer them quickly. Um, so anyway, um, We've got most of that covered. We look forward to hearing from you. We're always open to your ideas and thoughts on how to make our community safer for our horses and of course our mules. Don't forget the mules as well. But thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, we look forward to working with us. Give us, give us an, send us an email. Let us know what you liked about the presentation, what was boring, what we should omit. We're open to any uh, positive uh, criticism or critique. We just want to get better and reach as many people as we can. I realize this is NCAA finals night with Gonzaga. So when I realized that that was going on at the same time, I knew we wouldn't get, uh, <laughs> we wouldn't get a lot of population. So anyway, thanks to all of you for joining us. Sue, you got any final? No other than